gather, grow, give, go. Gather, grow, give, go. Gather, grow, give, go. Gather, grow, give, go. We are kingdom fellowship. We're kingdom focus. We gather to work.
Kingdom Focus. Well, this is the day the Lord has made and we are rejoicing. We are excited to be a part of another session of our Bible study as we sojourn in the things of the Spirit and God can show us those things he's already has planned out purpose for us and those things which he providentially has already put in place. I want to invite you to invite somebody else right now to be a part of this time of sharing in the word of God. Go ahead, reach out via whatever platform you like and let them know the word of God is going forth right here and tell them they can be a part of it. In, in fact, before we go another further, let's just go ahead and pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you glory and praise. We thank you, God, for summoning us to hear from your spirit. We pray now, God, that you might quiet us, that we might hear your still small voice. And then God, that you might give us strength to follow forward. I pray God for my brother, for my sister who finds themselves searching and seeking a new understanding and revelation, a closer walk and a deeper relationship with you. God, I pray that you will continue to be faithful to your word. You declared in your word that you are a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. So we seek you now uh, in this moment of study and we ask that your spirit will speak to the church that God we will hear from heaven and know what it is you would have us to do. Have your way right now. Bless us and get the glory for yourself. It's in Jesus name we want to say thank you and all God's children said amen. Well, I, of course, am excited because of all the wonderful things that are happening in the life of our congregation. We're excited about our upcoming Vacation Bible School. We're also excited because our children's ministries are available. We're not going to be having our regular children's church this coming Sunday because this coming Sunday is our scholarship Sunday. We're going to be handing out tens of thousands of dollars to members of our congregation and community uh, that are matriculating and furthering their education. I'm so grateful to God for our congregation's commitment consistently to further the education of brothers and sisters that they might actualize the native potential that God has placed on the inside of them. Before I go another further, I want to provide you the opportunity to be a blessing to this church and to this ministry, which of course is a blessing to you. It's time to receive our tithes and offering for this evening. I want to encourage you to give only as God has blessed you. God will never ask you to give that which first God has not supplied to you. And so you see the means of giving uh, demonstrated there on the screen. I pray that you will take advantage of them, that you will not simply ignore this part of the worship experience because giving is vital to worship. This is what uh, the, the writer declared, what shall I render unto God for all of his many benefits? The concept was that we never come empty handed to God who is the author and, and finish of our faith and the giver of every good and perfect gift. So let's just go ahead and seek the face of God in our giving. God, we give you glory and praise that we have it to give in the midst of rising interest rates and soaring inflation. God, we thank you that you continue to regulate and provide means for your children to make it in every season. And so God, we commit and we declare that we're gonna give our way through this season, that we trust that when we take care of your house, you will watch over and provide for our homes. So God bless the amount that we would have, uh, that we have to give. You instruct us as to what we should sow. We'll do it with a cheerful spirit because we know we can't beat you giving no matter how we try. It's in Jesus' name we wanna say thank you. And all God's children said, amen. Well, I am excited for several weeks now. We have been sojourning through the scriptures, looking at the spiritual fruit that sort of officially are annotated in Galatians, the fifth chapter. But in actuality, what we've come to realize is that much of the New Testament, certainly the Gospels, is a demonstration of not only the fruit of the Spirit, but the gifts of the Spirit, the authority, the graces, uh, the anointing, that, that to walk as a believer means that we actually have an inventory of attributes and uh, opportunities to express the power of God working through us. So we should not limit our understanding to the fruit of the Spirit, those nine fruit that are uh, demonstrated in Galatians 5, but we should understand that God has given us a treasure trove, a resource spiritually to navigate the challenges and vicissitudes of life and to achieve uh, the native potential that God has placed in us. So, so I want to invite you to sojourn with us further. We have been uh, working through a book uh, on spiritual fruit by a fellow by the name of Thomas Keating, and I wanted uh, to, to get to him. But before I do, let me sort of set as a substratum for our, our message tonight, this understanding. And that is that Jesus had both a public ministry and a private ministry. Jesus's public ministry is defined as preaching, teaching, and performing miracles. That is according to Matthew 4 and 23. And so when you read the gospels, much of what you read is Jesus engaged in that kind of activity. He's preaching 
uh, in the marketplace. He's teaching in the synagogue. He is providing parables as he walks down the road. He's preaching, he's teaching, but he's also performing miracles. Every time he runs into somebody with an issue, he oftentimes stops what he's doing to open up blind eyes, unstop stammering tongues. He's able to do miracles in the lives of people to demonstrate his authority, his power, most importantly, his identity as Messiah. But listen, Jesus had more than just a public ministry. He also had a private ministry. Jesus is private ministry to the disciples was based on modeling, mentoring, and correction. Of course, uh, the reference I use there is Mark the ninth chapter, beginning at the 29th verse. That's where, of course, after Jesus uh, walks into this crowd, there's such a commotion. The Bible says he asks what's going on. A man appears, says, my, my son is uh, grievously vexed with a demon. Your disciples could do nothing to deliver him. And of course, Jesus ultimately says, bring him to me, delivers the boy from his disease. Later on, they do an after event assessment. The disciples ask Jesus to the side, hey, why is it that we were not able to do anything with this? And Jesus responds, this kind comes by much fasting and prayer. And as a consequence, we want to recognize that what Jesus has just done after he's modeled public ministry, publicly his ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing. Now, privately, he's mentoring them and he's correcting them. He's trying to help them to understand what in fact it is that God has called them to do because you'll recall in Mark the sixth chapter, they had been granted authority and power. And as a consequence, he's saying to them, listen, there's more in you. There's nothing I need to give you, you already have it. You need to learn how to actualize it, to activate it, to operate it. And likewise, brothers and sisters, I wanna say that to you, that what you're waiting for, God is actually waiting for from you. You're waiting for your best life. You're waiting to walk in kingdom authority and power. I come to tell you, God already gave it to you when he gave you the power of the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit, which means that you have the graces, the gifts, the power, the authority, all that is necessary to live on top and not on bottom. But you've got to learn how to activate it. So in that particular instance, Jesus said very clearly, this kind comes by only much fasting and prayer. In other words, just because you have the gift doesn't mean the gift's going to operate if you don't exercise the gift. And one of the ways that you improve and exercise the gift is through fasting and prayer. Of course, on Sundays, we've been in our series on the house of prayer. And what I've been trying to share with you is that prayer, spiritual authority, prayer, spiritual fruit, prayer, spiritual gifts, those all go together. And when you are devoting yourself to God, spending time in God's spirit and centering prayer and quieting the voices of your own mind and the voices of our society and hearing the still small voice of God, God is able to then identify and activate things on the inside of you uh, that will give God glory and will be to your benefit or maybe even to the benefit of somebody else. And so Jesus had his public ministry. Jesus had his private ministry. The public ministry, of course, is when he's performing miracles to everybody else. But the private ministry is what he did with the disciples. And that private ministry, he listened to me, happened in, watch this word, community. Don't ever allow our secular, individualistic, narcissistic society to convince you that you can be the believer that God has called you to be by yourself. That Jesus himself, as the son of God, recognized that the first thing he needed was people around him because ultimately they would have to carry forward the vision and create the church. If Jesus needed people, and, and certainly if the disciples needed Jesus, then that would suggest to you and me that we can't make it on our own. We can't become what God desires for us to be and has divinely designed for us to be off on our own, trying to download our double anointing. I want you to understand that that's why God has given us the church. That's why God has given our church small groups. And that's why we have things like Bible study, because this is community right now. Even though we're not standing in the same place through the access of the internet. We right now are in spiritual community and the Holy Spirit is communing with us because he declared wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst. And so I want to encourage you to know that there is already more on the inside of you. God is trying to get it out. Spiritual fruition therefore requires engagement with public and the private ministries of Jesus. This was sort of a revelation to me and I thought I would share it with you. Oftentimes when I think of spiritual fruit, I literally think of those nine listed in Galatians 5. Now I'm beginning to understand that much of what Jesus did was to model for me what my life is supposed to look like. Think about it. Think about how Jesus would be in, in a crowd 
and he would discern what people were thinking in their hearts. I don't have it all the time, but every now and then God will give me inside information by his spirit about the agenda that some individual is operating on in my presence. It doesn't happen all the time, but every now and then I'm able to lay, the hand, lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I, I'm able to act, engage and exercise in the ministries and the fruit of the spirit that God, that Jesus demonstrated on earth. Now I'm beginning to understand that when I think of the spiritual fruit, I don't have to go just to Paul and, and the, the, the letters of the New Testament. I can actually look at the gospel because they are great examples of how to live fully in the spirit. So I wanted to use that as a background as now uh, I quote from Thomas Keating, who gives us a further understanding of how to exercise the spiritual fruit that God has placed on the inside of us. Uh, I, I titled this gradual enlightenment. We must convey, convince ourselves that there is a special presence of Christ in scripture that speaks to the hearts of those who are open and prepared. The Holy Spirit nudges us to perceive that what we hear refers to our personal situation and is meant to be a challenge and encouragement to us. Once we understand that the gospel addresses a presence within us that already exists, listening to the word of God becomes a process of gradual enlightenment. Wow. That's powerful because what he's basically saying is that we, when we approach scripture, we do so with the understanding that we're really allowing our hearts to hear from the heart of Christ. In fact, if you read John's gospel from the 14th through the 17th uh, chapters, you'll discover if you're reading an old school red letter Bible, all the words in those three chapters are read. And oftentimes it is referred to as the heart of Christ. Hear what that means. That means that when I open my Bible, I have the opportunity to actually have communion with God himself. He declares himself to be the word. In the beginning, uh, the word was with God and the word was God. And so that's why we have Bible study. Think about that. Every Christian church, you know, has Bible study or, or small groups or sometimes both. That it is that we literally center ourselves around the word of God because God's word provides for us the formula the roadmap, the ingredients to unlock all that God has placed on the inside of us as believers. Uh, I have this uh, software called Logos. It's Logos Bible software. and It's where I'm able to study in depth and get into the etymology and uh, the theology of many of the texts that I preach. And what I like about it is it is a voluminous uh, software program. It has thousands and thousands of books. And based on the subscription that you've paid for, uh, they are able to unlock a certain number of books. The books are there. It's not like they have to upload them. They're already rooted in the software, but in order for you to have access, you have to unlock it. When I read the word of God, the spirit of God is present to unlock the key of that passage and to reveal to me a truth that I otherwise could not access. And that truth then, according to what uh, Keating says, I need to understand applies to my particular situation. It applies to me personally. Now hear what that means. That means that that's why nobody can substitute for you what you need from God. My mother or my father, my spouse's faith can't get me through because the word of God is tailored to me, to my calling, to my situation. And I have to read it for myself so that God can speak uniquely and with specificity to me and to my circumstance. That's why you want to study to show yourself approved because until you open that word, until you get into that place where God is able to speak to you, you will continue to grope and grasp to try to find your own way rather than simply follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. So here it is. Uh, Keating is saying that when I read scripture, I understand that I'm actually having an encounter with Christ. I have the ability to hear his word for myself. I'm able to then apply it because I understand that it's speaking to my personal situation and it's meant to be a challenge and encouragement to me. Let me give you uh, just a couple of verses as to what that really looks like from the word of God. Of course, uh, we know in Matthew's gospel, Jesus 
uh, deals with a parable about the sower and the seed. You know it very well. He talks about the sower that sowed seed in various kinds of soils. Some fell on the road and it was taken away by uh, the birds. Some fell into uh, rocky ground. It grew for a little while and then uh, it dirt burned out. Some fell amongst the thorns. It grew for a little while. Then it got choked out. And then it says some fell in good soil and produced a harvest, some 30, 60 and 100 fold. So watch this. After he tells the parable, then he tries to have to explain it because the disciples don't understand. So Jesus says, okay, let me break it down like a fraction. He goes through each one of the soils and explains to them what he's referring to. Here's his explanation of the last bit of soil that which he refers to as good soil. He says, but we, he would, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, and some 30. What that means is that when my heart is open, when I recognize that I'm having an encounter with Christ, when I read the word of God and that the word is going to be applied personally to me, then that all of a sudden, that word, which is general, becomes seed as good soil. I get the revelation and I recognize that this word is made uniquely for me. That's enough to shout about right there because what that tells me is that God is not a generalist, that God does not have some just general idea for humanity, but he knows the number of hairs upon my head that I have a unique calling and place in him and in his kingdom and in his church. And as a consequence, I need to personally seek after him that I might understand the unique things that he has placed in my life and for my ministry. So first of all, I understand that when I read the word, I'm having an encounter with Christ. But then secondarily, here's what I mean when I talk about that God has made this word, word uniquely tailored to me. John, the fourth chapter in the 16th verse, very familiar passage. Of course, Jesus is talking to what we refer to as the woman by the well. And uh, they've gone through several rounds. He starts off by asking her for a drink. She reminds him that as a Samaritan, they're not supposed to be talking at all. They have no, no things in common. And then Jesus uh, goes a little bit further and says this. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. <laughs> Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one and, and one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, <laughs> I perceive you are a prophet. I don't know how you can read that and not laugh. Basically, Jesus reads her whole card. He's like, okay, I'll tell you what, do me a favor, call your husband. And she's slick. I don't have a husband. Well, technically that's true. Now here's the, the tension in the text. He says, you've had five husbands and the one you're with now is not your husband, which can either mean she's with somebody else's husband, shout out to Shirley Murdoch, or she is shacking. She is with a man, but she is not married to the man. In either case, she's wrong and Jesus calls her out. And after he calls her out, you know what she says? I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you've just, you've just shown me myself in your word. And brothers and sisters, that's how God grows us in the spirit. Not only does he reveal to us his purpose and plan and promise, but secondarily, he also shows us those places in our lives that are incongruent with his word and will for our lives. Listen, while the promises of God are yes and amen, it all ain't amen because some stuff God can't agree with because it's outside of his word for our lives. And one of the ways God shows us he loves us is by correcting us. For those he loves, he chastens. Which simply means that as I walk in the spirit, the spirit shows me what is right and the spirit convicts me when I do wrong. I'm gonna try that again. The spirit shows me how to do right. He shows me where I can be kind and gentle. He shows me how to, uh, to experience and exude long suffering. But he also convicts me when I speak out of my flesh and not of my spirit. He, he reminds me that that's not how, as his son, I'm called to act in that circumstance. And brothers and sisters, here's what I want you to understand. Don't you run out from the hand of God when God moves to correct you. Now, I can't speak for you. But one of the cardinal sins in the Watley household growing up was after you had to go outside and pick your switch and come back to get your whooping. The last thing you wanted to do was try to get loose when you were getting your whooping. Oh, you'd get a double anointing for that because you had tried to wrest yourself out of the hand. 
of that which the, the individual I was trying to correct you. Brothers and sisters, don't run away just because sometimes the word of God convicts you. God is convicting you so he can convert you. Now, uh, I want to say this here, and I, I, I hope that you'll walk with me. The spirit convicts, the devil condemns. Let me do that again. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The devil condemns us. Okay, so, so think about it in legal terms because, of course, this is straight out of uh, Scripture. Jesus is referred to as our advocate. Uh, that term uh, also is like a lawyer, the, the one who's representing you, right? And, of course, Jesus uh, also is considered to be our defender. After all, it's his blood that pays for our sin debt and our penalty. So the Spirit convicts us because we're guilty. So, you know, every trial does not go to trial. Every trial doesn't go to the jury. Uh, oftentimes, the defendant who is guilty just pleads guilty. And brothers and sisters, that's what confession is. Confession says, I ain't gonna waste the court's time. I'm gonna throw myself on the mercy of the court. I'm going to acknowledge and admit, I did it. I planned to do it. I got a special outfit I wanted to do it in. I got an Uber to go and get involved in what I was gonna get involved with. I had a perfect plan to mess up, right? So now that I've been caught up, there's no point in me trying to deny the obvious sense of the truth, so I'm gonna confess it, right? I've been convicted, I know I was wrong, I confess it. By confessing it, I now take it out of the hand of the devil who seeks to condemn me. The Bible refers to the devil as the accuser of the brethren. He's like the prosecutor, and, and he's a dirty prosecutor. He'll, he'll, he'll throw some evidence in there, it shouldn't even be in there. But here's the thing, I've said it before, I'll say it again here. My biggest issue with the devil is not when he lies on me, my biggest issue is when he tells the truth on me. Because the truth of the matter is, I am a wretch undone. The truth of the matter is, all of my righteousness is as filthy rags. But here's the difference. When the Holy Spirit convicts me, he's convicting me to change me, to convert me, to be more like my Father in heaven. The devil, on the other hand, convicts to condemn. He wants me to feel unworthy of having a relationship with my Heavenly Father. He wants me to feel unworthy of being able to serve in ministry. He makes me want to feel unworthy even to come to church in person. And so you have to be able to acknowledge what you've done so that you take that arrow out of the hand of the devil, that you can be convicted so that you might be converted. That is the work of the Spirit. And what I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, is that God is trying to grow you and develop you and mature you into being more like his son and to, again, take advantage of all that he's placed on the inside of you. And, and so I want to encourage us to know that what the walk of the Spirit, the spiritual life looks like, it looks like to live like Jesus. It looks like, and I know that seems like a tall order. To live like Jesus, I can't walk on water. I can't multiply fish and loaves. Yeah, but Jesus also said, greater works have I done. Will you do so? How can I do greater work than Jesus? Well, I'll tell you. Right now, I'm, 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 I'm on the internet. And this internet has the ability to, to reach tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people more in my lifetime in ministry than Jesus reached in his lifetime in ministry. That sounds like greater works to me. All I'm trying to suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, is that God, that Jesus is our model. He shows us how we can live in victory. And the way that we access those instructions is in his word and by his spirit and prayer. I want to invite you to unlock the key of all of the gifts and tools and graces and fruit that God has, has on the inside of you. And they're just waiting for you to turn the knob. But let me just ask you some, some, some concluding questions, some reflection questions that I think will help you in your study uh, for the next coming week. First of all, who are your spiritual models and mentors? Hmm. Now you should understand why I made the statement earlier that you can't try to be uh, who God wants you to be by yourself. All of us have to look to someone to show us the way. Uh, I've been fishing since I was five or six years old. I have never read a book on fishing. And I want you to know I'm one of the best fishermen you'll ever meet. Why? Because I had a great mentor. My father has, has taught me early on how to tie different knots and how to set my hook and to use certain baits and to read the tide. I, I learned those things because I modeled what I saw. I had a mentor who took time to pour into me. And when I didn't do it right, 
he corrected me. You need to have persons in your life. God's plan for, to develop you as a disciple is for you to be in relationship with individuals that can spur you forward in faith. You have to have a pastor to speak and to rightfully divide the word of truth in your life. But you also have to have some other people that can walk alongside of you daily and can serve as an example. There's somebody in your life, they may be family or friend or coworker, but somebody has an authentic walk with God. Don't take access to that individual for granted. Let me put it this way. If you had a friend who was a billionaire and didn't mind sharing the secrets of their success with you, wouldn't you seek them out? Wouldn't you be intentional about spending time with them? Well, I want to let you know there's somebody in your life that can offer you something more than the secret to billions. They can offer you the secret to eternal life and abundant life while you're here on earth. So I want to encourage you to be intentional, not to put somebody in God's place, not to make somebody a little idol or your personal pastor, but to recognize that for everyone that desires, God is a reward and therefore there's somebody that God is going to use to help show you the step forward and then you have a responsibility to turn around and be a mentor and model to somebody else. So, so that was my first question. Uh, who are your models and mentors? And if you don't have any that come really to mind, then you need to pray on it so that God can show you who he's put in your life. Second question, does conviction work in your life more often as correction or condemnation, right? So, 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 so when you recognize you're wrong, does it lead you to correcting yourself or feeling so bad that you feel defeated. I want you to know the first is from God and the second is not. And even though they look similar, they're diametrically op opposed. The Bible says that God declared he would that none should perish. And therefore he would never allow or desire for any of us to live feeling unworthy of relationship with him. So I want to encourage you to know that no matter what you've done, how many times you've done it and how much you enjoyed it while you're doing it, that God declares that he has more in store and at the moment you're willing to confess it, he's ready to forgive it, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to provide you uh, a new opportunity to live in the spirit. So, so let me get to my last question. I'll, I'll leave you for this evening. What markers of spiritual fruition are you using to measure your growth in God? Here's what I know. Nothing that is successful can be successful without being measured, right? So, so if I'm, I want to get in shape and I go to the gym and I get a trainer, the first, I mean the very first thing the trainer's going to do is put me on a scale. They're going to uh, measure my, uh, my, my body fat uh, index. That They're going to take all these measures because they want to identify a baseline so that once I start working out, once I change my diet, once I get disciplined, we can see my growth, we can see my change, we can see my evolution. Well, brothers and sisters, how long have you been saved? How long have you known the Lord? Now the question is, how much have you grown? And how do you know that you've grown? See, the kingdom of God, we don't have grades like we do in school or ranks like we do in the military or positions and in, 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 in organizational charts like we do in our job. So how do we know that we're developing as disciples? I would suggest to you one of the great ways you know is by the way in which you are operating in the fruit and the gifts and the graces of the spirit that one of the best ways I know I'm growing in God and being furthered in my faith is because I'm no longer acting like I used to act. The power of the Holy Spirit is now moving more freely in my life. I'm giving him more access to make decisions. I'm literally giving Jesus the wheel. And as a consequence, I'm experiencing different things and I'm getting different results. I want to encourage you to know that God has called you to grow and therefore it's necessary that you develop a growth dashboard, right? And don't let it just be a religious one. How long did I pray? Did I pray enough today? Did I read my Bible today? That, that's a good basic start. But really you want to get into how am I seeing life differently? How am I treating people differently? How am I viewing myself differently? How is my life lining up with the word? How am I doing in terms of my financial stewardship, my stewardship of my time and my talent? How am I doing in terms of my service to the church and in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ? These are the questions that help, to, help us to determine 
whether we are moving in the spirit or we're simply marking time in the flesh. And the great news of the glorious gospel is that God has given to each and every one of us. There's no special uh, cutouts and carve outs in the kingdom of God. All of us have access to the same resources. And therefore I want to encourage you to make sure you're making full proof of the ministry that God has given you. I want to stop right now and extend the invitation for anybody who doesn't know the Lord Jesus for yourself. If you're unsaved or unsure what salvation is all about, I got good news. Today is the day of salvation. I want to invite you to come forward and acknowledge online right now the status that you need uh, to be saved. Go ahead and reach out to that number, uh, 240-201-3300. Text the words new start there and within a matter of minutes, someone's gonna reach out to you pray through the prayer of salvation. There's another crowd I want to invite. That's those who may be saved, but don't have a church home where we are growing. And they need us to believe in God, you need to belong to his house. And listen, you don't have to wait till Sunday morning. You don't have to wait till you physically walk down the aisle. You can take care of this business right now. I would love to serve as your pastor. We would love to serve as your church family. So you go ahead, go ahead and reach out too, and somebody will reach, reach right back to you. Let's just pause and pray. Father, we thank you for the eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. We thank you for all that you've placed on the inside of us. Now, God, help us to move forward so that you might be able to realize what you had in mind when you formed and fashioned us in our mother's womb. God, I give you glory and praise for the one that comes forward for salvation or to join the church. God, allow them to find their place in your kingdom and in your church that they might glorify you all the days of their, their lives. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. All God's children said amen. Brothers and sisters, I've been blessed of God tonight. I pray that you have as well. Kingdom focused.